for, for the talk and for the discussions. Um, is Thomas around? And I think yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. Well, My screen here is next to you. Uh, you should be able to, to share your screen, Thomas, if you uh, if you like. Okay, let me see. Uh, I'm going to look. Let me try this. Okay. Thomas Muller from the University of Constance uh, will tell us about two types of indeterminism in quantum correlation experiments, a branching space-time analysis. And I should say this is a joint work with uh, another Thomas, Thomas Platzek. Mm -hmm. That's it. I'm sorry, I think I have a problem with, uh, with sharing my screen in my uh, in my uh, computers. Um, let me see, I, I may have to go out of, of, out of uh, Zoom and come in again. Sorry, just a sec. I'm, I'm very happy about that. Okay, thanks for having me and uh, thanks for, um, um, yeah, thanks all for coming. This is joint work uh, with Tomasz Platzek, who is also in the audience. And actually connecting with uh, Nicolas' talk, there was a time maybe uh, almost 25 years back when Tomasz and I were, were discussing which research project to embark on. And one option was really uh, to go for Hermann Weil's The Continuum, which, uh, which was one of the, uh, the attempts in the early 20th century of working out intuitionistic mathematics as a basis for standard mathematics. And somehow, um, Nicola, you, you mentioned this discussion between Hilbert and, um, and Brauer. So history went another way, but maybe it's coming back. Uh, so anyway, at this time, many years back, Tomas and I uh, started to embark on a project uh, on branching space times which is a framework introduced by Newell Belknap in 1992. And I'll talk, uh, I'll tell you something about that framework and how we can analyze quantum correlation experiments as experiments in that framework. So, um, so, can I... uh, so the context of my talk is, is a broader interest of mine, which is that uh, we see that science is becoming more and more uh, automatized, right? So computers are used not just in data analysis or in simulating ex uh, experiments before we set them up, but they are being used in the conduction of experiments uh, real time. And that uh, may cause some tension because we may start asking who is doing the experiment, right? So who, who is running the experiment? Is it the computer? Is it us? We know that in bell type experiments, there is an important point made about so called measurement independence, where the intervention of the experiment in setting experimental uh, parameters is important for the derivation of the bell inequalities. And you all know that the big bell test collaboration uh, went to great lengths to actually use uh, human choices in, in bell tests to select these measurement parameters, but normally it's done automatically and we're all fine with that. Um, what I want to contribute to this, to this whole thing is just a formal analysis on what difference it makes if um, an event is assigned to the experimenter versus to nature, as it were. So um, experiments are special, we all know that. When, when we look at the scientific uh, revolution and the rise of modern science from the 17th century on experiment played a crucial role. We say that experiment gives us knowledge uh, a posteriori and that's often glossed as knowledge by observation, but experiment is really not just observation, right? And experiment involves intervention. It's a topic that's not been much studied in philosophy of science, even though it's super important, but there are some studies around. Um, and what comes out as, as distinguishing experiments from mere observation, as we do in astronomy, for example, is that on the one hand, we can make things happen that simply would not happen naturally. So laboratories are very special places in which conditions are such that things happen that don't happen naturally. 
also we can make enough of those things happen such that we can conduct valid statistics and we can test hypotheses. We can shield our experiments in such a way that we're pretty clear on what influences uh, the course of nature in the lab and that's much different from what happens in nature. For example, look at um, determining the melting point of gold. Right, of course, gold has molten uh, on the surface of the earth uh, for many millions of years, but usually in, ex in, in conditions that, you, that are messy, right? in volcanoes maybe, or in, in some other, uh, yeah, difficult to control places. And now we can do it in the lab and we have a different uh, way of, of finding out what the melting point of gold is. We couldn't have done that if we had to rely merely on what happens naturally because we would normally not survive these, these conditions to do experiments there. And uh, so a fourth point is that in doing an experiment, since we are in control of the interventions, we can find out about directions of causal influence. And that's not something we can do by merely um, analyzing correlations. You know that we are certainly, in, uh, we're currently in, in the strange uh, times when many interventions happen that were not pre-planned and that we can study as if experiments had been happening, so-called natural experiments. So sometimes it is the case, like uh, air traffic shuts down for a year or so, we can study the result of such interventions, even though these interventions were not planned beforehand, but that's a special uh, case. So normally experiments are really due to what experimenters uh, plan and then execute. In quantum correlations experiments, um, and I've already said that, these we really need to treat as experiments in order to derive anything of interest for um, the quantum violations community. So when we, um, when we analyze quantum correlation experiments and derive bell type inequalities, uh, we really need um, to treat the experimental intervention in a special way and uh, at least metaphorically, that's often connected with human choices. Um, but to quote John Bell, the alternative is that the experimental parameters and the experimental results are both consequences of some common hidden mechanism. And he calls that a conspiracy. I think that's still the mainstream view. We, we saw already in Nicolas' talk that there are proponents of a, a super deterministic option that uh, think uh, otherwise. But most of the literature on quantum correlations experiments really goes that way and says we have to treat these choices uh, separately. Also, if we want to keep our funding for experimental physics, I think it's wise to uh, keep pointing out that what we do really makes a difference. Okay, so here is, uh, here is the structure of my talk. I'll first give you a, a brief overview of the branching space times framework. And I'm going to stay on a, a very informal level. So I'm not going to give you all the formal definitions. Um, and also, I'm not going to be talking a lot about probabilities. I'll use probabilities in my initial motivation, but then I'll move on to be talking just about um, combination of possibilities because there I think the picture is clearer and um, I can still something useful I hope. Um, so I will give a formal account of how you can add hidden variables in this branching space time framework very generally and then I'll be looking at uh, Merman's version of the GHC uh, setup and show what we can say from a branching space times perspective on the distinction between uh, experimental intervention and nature's indeterminism in, in these setups. And I'll have a brief summary at the end. So, um, branching space times, I already said initially, was invented by Newell Belknap in 1992. And it combines a, pos a, a representation of branching possibilities for the future. So, a certain representation of the open future with a rudimentary relativistic space-time structure. Um, 
This is a specific way of representing possibilities, this branching representation, which is not the mainstream. The mainstream represents possibilities in terms of separate possible worlds that sit one side by side to the other. And where you have maybe notions of similarity or some other um, yeah, epistemic relations that bind the possibilities together. Here the idea is really that the possibilities are connected in nature by uh, this branching tree of future possibilities. I think that's really our standard view of thinking about possibilities in normal life, right? We think, oh, I could have another coffee and what would happen then? Or I could not have the coffee and then uh, something else might happen. And that's not something we think of in terms of happening in different possible worlds. It's something that can happen in this world. And I'm actually in charge of making the one thing happen or the other. So um, this uh, branching space time framework has been around for almost 30 years. And now there's a book forthcoming with the title Branching Space Times, uh, which will be forthcoming this year with Oxford University Press. And Noel Belknap, myself, and Tomasz are the authors of that book. Uh, so the book is thick, and there's a lot of stuff in there. And um, mostly what I'm going to be using in this talk is a representation of how possibilities in space and time combine. And these possibilities com can combine smoothly or not so smoothly. And when they don't combine smoothly, we have something that is called modal funny business. And I'll introduce that for you. And there's also a probabilistic side to it, which I'll not be talking a lot about. And with respect to the hidden variables, there is uh, the idea of structure extension and certain independence assumptions that we can define. So let's go right in. Why should you be using uh, branching space times as a framework? And I'm going to give you a riddle. Some of you may know this. It's a, uh, it's a well-known riddle in the foundations of probability theory. And it's called Humphrey's Paradox. So Humphreys, a philosopher of science, wrote a paper in 1985 that says that propensities, that's this idea that you can have single case probabilities for happenings in nature, that they could not be represented as probabilities. And his argument is quite simple. So suppose we have a two stage setup, we first select setting alpha or setting beta with certain probabilities. Then on setting alpha, we do another uh, probabilistic event with two outcomes, maybe the same probability one half. Of course, the probability of getting result alpha plus of alpha, given that we actually selected beta, has to be zero, right? The same for alpha minus condition on zero, on, on beta. Also, since first we make the selection and then the later experiment, the propensity of the setting is not influenced by what happens later. Because what happens later happens later. So the conditional propensity. Humphrey's claims of alpha given that later alpha plus is measured is the same as the propensity of alpha given that alpha minus is measured, which is simply the propensity of selection alpha. Now, if you take these assumptions, you can show that Bayes' theorem fails for propensities. Right? You can do a, a calculation with uh, using Bayesian inversion, and you find out that this number one third. Uh, which is um, which is the given propensity of alpha conditional on alpha plus actually has got to be one, and that doesn't work. So, um, what kind of diagnosis can we give? I think the crucial point here is how do the propensities combine, and that. Um, you take a two by two layout, either alpha or beta, either alpha plus or alpha minus, and you find out that you just cannot stick in at numbers such that it makes any sense, right? Um, alpha plus and beta cannot happen. So it's got to be propensity zero. Alpha minus and beta cannot happen. Also propensity zero. So the propensity of alpha has got to be one, but it's one third, and that's the problem. So using branching space times or generally a branching representation, you can resolve the problem. 
because you need to look at not just how the propensities combine, but how the possibilities underlying the structure, how they combine. So in a branching representation, I hope you can see my, uh, my cursor. Um, you, can, you can look at the whole setup as a two-stage setup in this branching representation, and you see that there are no four possibilities that you want to represent, but only three. Right? It's either, so the, the fine-grained possibilities are alpha and alpha plus, alpha and alpha minus, or beta. And then there's no problem with propensities, and there's also no problem with Bayesian inversion. If you calculate the conditional uh, propensity of alpha given alpha plus, you do a calculation based on the, um, on the possibilities in this two-stage uh, version, and then you get the number one, which was disturbing um, for, uh, for Humphreys, but is not disturbing on this representation. So that's, I, I hope, a good motivation for using uh, branching representations of possibility, because you can uh, represent these layered setups and the possibilities at play in these layered setups in a way that causes no problem for the probability theory. Now, I said I, I won't be talking a lot about uh, probabilities. I will stick to the possibilities underlying the probabilities. Um, and I want to introduce to you this notion of modal correlations and modal phonicisms. So a possibility, I said, technically, uh, that is going to be what is called a transition, which consists of an initial, like uh, this alpha here, and then an outcome of the initial. Um, some sets of uh, transitions, when you put them together, some sets are uh, consistent, and some sets are inconsistent. Um, and if a set of transitions is inconsistent, that's modal correlations. Uh, now, sorry, sorry yeah? to interrupt you, Thomas. Uh, uh, would you mind taking a clarificatory question? Or would you prefer waiting till the end? I, I can take a question, sure. Uh, then there's a question from Renato. Yes. Um, <clears throat> hi, Thomas. I have a, a question about, actually, maybe the notation. So yeah. the Humphrey paradox slide that you showed before. You showed yeah. us before. Oh, maybe even one before that. Um, the one where you introduced it, yes. Here, so you use this notation, for example, in the force entry probability of alpha and then vertical arrow alpha plus. And the vertical arrow I interpret as conditioned on what comes yeah. after. Right. Now, um, if this is the case, um, why is it, I mean, with this interpretation clear that you have this equality between um, the probability of alpha given alpha minus is equal to the probability of alpha because in I would interpret the first, or as you said, it's conditioned on there was already yeah. alpha and minus. So it's yeah. uh, if I condition on that event, I would have thought it's clear that it should be one. So maybe I'm just misinterpreting that. No, no, then you're on my side. Thank you. <laughs> so that's good. But in the paper, uh, which is an important paper, an important reference in the foundations of probability, that assumption is defended as saying, uh, look, propensities are these uh, single case probabilities for events in, uh, in a temporal sequence. And what the probability of something cannot depend on what happens later, because that hasn't, hasn't happened. So it's, it's Humphrey's attempt to spell out what is specific about propensities as not simple probabilities, but something that describes um, chance setups. And in a chance setup, it shouldn't be the case that the probability now depends on what happens later. Okay. And his way, he wants to find a way of expressing that. And I think he's right in, in, in demanding that we find a way of expressing that. And given, I think the the underlying assumption that it has to be a two by two layout, that's the way he writes it down. And given that assumption, he is able to prove a contradiction, which is then why um, propensities cannot be probabilities. But you're right, if we- Thanks for clarifying. 
okay, if you choose a different representation, then, uh, then the problem vanishes. And that's my, my selling point for a branching representation of possibilities here. So coming back to these, these modal correlations, so sometimes you have a combination of possibilities such that the overall scenario is impossible. For example, here, uh, you take an initial alpha and you combine the outcome alpha plus and the alternative outcome alpha minus. That's impossible, right? So uh, this will be a modal correlation, according to my definition here. It's a set of transitions that is inconsistent. But of course, no one wonders why that is the case, because you lump together impossible alternatives, right? The alternatives to one another. Now look at this scenario where you have an initial selecting alpha or beta. So you take the initial, you take the transition to alpha, and then you take another transition from beta to one of beta's outcomes. And that again is inconsistent. Uh, and there's no wonder it's inconsistent because for beta to happen, the earlier chance event would have to have had outcome beta, not alpha. Right? So here you also have an inconsistency that is easily explained. But what happens if alpha and beta are space-like separated? And you take the outcome alpha plus of alpha and the outcome of uh, beta, beta minus. If that turns out to be inconsistent, if that turns out not to happen, to be impossible, then we have a problem, right? Then we can't, we don't have a, an explanation of why the inconsistency occurs. So you can have these, um, you have two, two definitions of modal funny business. One that uh, is linked to the idea that we have a certain assumption about combinatorics. So space-like separated chance events should combine smoothly. Any combination of, uh, of outcomes should be possible. And then you can define what, what is combinatorial funny business. Or you can say that there is no explanation for the inconsistency. And that means just in the past, you don't find um, incompatible possibilities run together in this rightmost scenario. Right? It just so happens that alpha and beta, they're not separated earlier on. Uh, they're space-like separated and still some uh, combination of outcomes does not happen, cannot happen. So that's the instrument I'm going to use, this distinction between um, impossibilities, some of which are good to understand and others are weird. So um, now let's look at how we can um, extend a given structure, a surface structure, uh, by adding more explanatory detail. And that is, this, um, that is now a construction in branching spacetimes that is not specific to quantum mechanics at all. You can do it with any um, chance up, setup. It only so happens that the interesting cases for analysis are from quantum mechanics. And the important point, and this comes back to why use branching representations, is that uh, what I'm showing on the lower uh, part of this panel, these uh, space-time diagrams with the C1s, C2s, and the X1s, X2s, or Y1s, Y2s, this is all together. All these space-time diagrams together and glued together is the modal representation of a single run of an experiment, right? So there is one, uh, one experiment uh, represented in terms of its full modal structure. So we don't look at types of runs, we look at what is really happening in the lab. And I think that's how we, how we naturally think about conducting experiment, right? It has certain possibilities. The, the single run has certain possibilities for playing out and we can represent them. Now we make a distinction between what the experimenter does, and I call that the set C of choices, that's the lower two C1, C2, that are always present in all of the possibilities. And then there are possibilities, what can happen as a result of uh, nature playing out in some way. 
I call that the set E of events. And now we see that in this simple uh, case, uh, there is um, there's a layered structure. It doesn't have to be layered. The theory is more general than that. Now, why do we want to extend such a structure? Uh, when do we want to extend such a structure? If we have, if you calculate, it's, uh, it's always two by two. So if you have these 16 possibilities all present, there's nothing you need to explain. But some of these possibilities may actually be missing. And then you want to say why they are missing. So um, let's assume there is some modal funny business. What type of modal funny business can there be? There cannot be, we think, modal funny business among the choices of the experimenters, because those are independent agents. Right? They make their choices by themselves. Also, modal funny business between what the experimenters choose and what is possible at the surface has just not been observed experimentally. That would be signaling across space like uh, separation and that we can do. So the interesting cases of modal funny business that call for explanation in, in such a setup will be um, only among the E um, transitions. So for example, it may be that there is no x1 minus x2 minus possibility. We, could, we can find that out by doing the experiment many times. We find out it never happens. It's impossible. So um, the surface structure that we start with will be what we call CE independent. There will be no modal funny business between members of C of the experimenter's choices and members of E, the natural events. And if we have that, then we can look at a formal procedure that extends such a structure. Um, so you, you can think back of uh, simple deterministic hidden variables. You choose a point, E star, let's call it, which sits below all the E members. And you take a set uh, I of instruction sets, lambda, that pertain to the outcomes of E. And now in, in extending the structure, what you do is at E star, you put in a new splitting, you put in a new um, yeah, range of possibilities. And ideally, these possibilities then give instructions for what should happen at the members of E. So from the left-hand side to the right-hand side here, you see that I, I made the axis smaller, because there are no more indeterministic events in the extended structure, but they simply read out the instructions of what is given at E star. So, so far, this is all, I think, uh, very, uh, very well known, but we have a formal handle on this construction in branching space times. And normally, this is uh, glossed over or, or just indicated in probes, and we can really define what it means to extend the structure in this way. Now, uh, what, what kinds of instruction sets can we define? And here, uh, branching space times by itself is very open. It could be more or less any way of giving information pertaining to E. Right? And the well-known uh, types of instruction set that we know from, from the discussion of bell type uh, experiments is non-contextual and contextual instruction sets. And we can define precisely what that means. So a non-contextual extension is where lambda provides a partial function from E to the outcomes. So for each of the little e on which lambda says something, it says something uniquely. Right? The measurement context plays no role. And in a contextual extension, there may be more than one instruction pertaining to a given e, but and that's something that I think we, we can say in BST, and it's difficult to say if you don't have the formal representation. We can point out that these different instructions then have to be differentiated by a different um, outcome of one of the experimenters' choices C. So I'm give, not giving you the formal, uh, formal definition, but just telling you what, what the formal definitions are. Now, here's an interesting case, and um, that is really my, my main theme. Uh, when we have no experimenter's choices, 
or when we take the experimenter's choices to be part of what happens in nature, so part of what is accounted for by this E, so that our set E of indeterministic events is all the indeterminism there is, right? then we can always give an account of any amount of modal correlations by very simply defining a super deterministic ex extension, which is a non-contextual extension. You simply push down all the indeterminism to your new event E star. And then everything else is just reading out the instructions. And we all know that, right? So when we account for a quantum correlation experiment in such a way that the hidden variable also instructs the um, selection of settings, then uh, we cannot define, uh, we cannot derive a, a bell inequality. We need this distinction between C and E in order to, uh, to uh, find out anything very interesting. So in case C is not equal to zero, so in case we make this distinction between experimental choices and what happens in nature, then when is an extension satisfactory? That's so far a fairly fluffy question, right? And that's where I think within branching space times we can say something interesting. Um, so the first question is, give me a surface structure, give me a set of instruction sets, can I define an extended structure? And in branching space times, the answer is yes. You can define an extended structure. You can define what it means to extend a structure by a non-contextual hidden variables or by contextual hidden variables. But, and that's what's, uh, what's maybe interesting in this analysis, this extended structure may end up having novel types of modal funny business. And those will be unwelcome. And that's why we say that there is um, a certain no-go result, let's say, for the introduction of these hidden variables. So what this means in branching space time is not that it can be defined, but it can be defined, but it has features that we don't like. So let's look at this in the context of GHC. Um, um, or no, first, sorry. First, I, I want, to, want to tell you what we don't like. Um, so when we have C and E both present, and there was no modal funny business by connecting C and E because that would be signaling, uh, then in an extended structure, we don't want to have modal funny business between outcomes lambda of the hidden variable selection and selections by the experimenters. And we also don't want modal funny business between the selections of the experimenters and any remaining indeterminism in nature. And that's exactly what I'm going to show you happens in, in extending the GHC surface structure. Okay? So for the non-contextual extension, we get a problem with E star, and for the contextual one, we get a problem with E. So here's the GHC surface structure, which you all know. This is Merman's uh, 1990 nice rendering um, of, the, of the setup. So uh, there is modal funny business. You have this uh, here in a, in a branching representation, you have one layer of choices, C1, C2, C3 in the three wings of the experiment. Then you have possible uh, measurement initials, X1 or Y1, X2 or Y2, or X3 or Y2. Those will be nature's events. And there should be 64 uh, possibilities if everything combined combinatorially smoothly. But in fact, there are only 48 possibilities and you can spell out which possibilities are absent by these nice rules, triple X, uh, odd number of minus outcomes, double Y, one X, even number of minus outcomes, right? So that's the surface structure and we can define it. We can just write it down in BST. And now what is the non-contextual extension of that surface structure? Ideally, a non-contextual instruction set should give a direction for each member of E, right? So for all these six initials, x1, y1, x2, y2, x3, y3, but as you can show quite simply, there are no six element uh, 
instruction sets that satisfy both triple X and double Y rules. So we can still define the con non-contextual instruction sets, but they will not be six element, but they will be five element instruction sets. So you can, you can give six instructions. So the most you can do uh, consistently is you give five instructions. So you can, you can write this down like, like this. Right? So there's a five element instruction set, which as you can check, satisfies the rules. You can also write this in terms of possible triples of uh, X's or Y's, right? So then you have this, um, it caters for four scenarios. And that means it does not cater for a scenario in which experimenter two selects Y2 rather than X2. So in the extended structure that you can define, these possibilities are absent. On this lambda, experimenter two must be prevented from choosing Y2. So you really have a troublesome new case of modal funny business, which is worse, one might say, than the surface modal funny business in the surface structure, which was only among the, the, the E-type events. Here it's now modal funny business between the selection of lambda at E star and the uh, experimenter's choices. And for, for any of the instruction sets here, you have a similar kind of trouble, of course, because they're all five element. So that's why the non contextual extension fails. Any question or? OK. Then uh, let's look at what happens when you try to introduce contextual instruction sets. Here, an instruction set uh, will have to specify instructions for each selection of the settings. And you, you give more freedom. It doesn't have to be a partial function. So there can be a different instruction for an event from E given uh, a certain measurement context, so given a selection of um, outcomes of C. Right? So a typical instruction set lambda that again satisfies all these, um, all these uh, rules looks like this. It has eight elements for each combination of x's and y's. And now if you, if you look at it uh, in detail, you see that for y3 in this set, there are incompatible instructions depending on the measurement outcome. Now in branching space times, the story doesn't end here, but we can really extend the structure so we can define a new uh, BST structure in which at E star, these Lambda instruction sets are put in and we can look at what results. And the fact is that the, um, the E element Y3, so measuring in the Y direction at uh, station three in the extension on this Lambda remains an indeterministic event. So it, it has two possible outcomes, right? Because what comes out depends on the measurement context. And so, um, if, if you look at it, it should be that both these outcomes, since they can both occur on Lambda, they should both be compatible with all the distant settings, but that is not the case. So there is no possibility here for getting Y3 plus outcome with the settings X1 and X2, because on X1 and X2, uh, you get y3 minus only. Right? And so again, from a structure that had a modal funny business among members of E, you get at a deeper layer in the extended structure, a structure where there's now modal funny business between nature's outcomes, so y3, and the um, measurement settings c1 and c2. And as I've said, that's something we don't want to be committed to. 
So note, this is only modal funny business now in the extended structure. It doesn't mean that we can signal with this. It's not visible at the surface level because the surface level glosses over all the possibilities and we don't know the outcome lambda, of course. But still, as an explanation of the surface correlations, I guess we will think that this is not satisfactory. And uh, so now I'm coming to, to the end of my talk. Um, I hope I have showed you that there are good reasons for using branching representations of possibilities, not just for modal correlations, but also for probabilities. Um, and in this branching space times framework, you can really represent formally in mathematical detail a single run of an experiment in its modal detail, as we would very naively write it down in terms of what can I do, what can happen as a result. We can also prove ma mathematically what the um, extension of such a structure amounts to, and it will be a transformation of the initially given structure to a new structure. Uh, which also describes a single run of an experiment, now in terms of additional um, given structure, right? And um, now for, for us to gain any traction, to do anything interesting, we have to distinguish the C-type and E-type indeterminisms in the surface structure. Otherwise, we can just give um, a super deterministic extension and we cannot prove anything interesting. Um, but if we make this distinction and in GHC it's obvious what the distinction will have to be, the experimenters are in control of the measurement settings and then nature as it were is in control of what happens as a result. If we make that distinction and we do the calculations and we define these extended structures, we see that the cure is really worse than disease because we started out with unexplained surface correlations among what happens in nature and we end up with entangling the experimenter with um, some of the uh, other stuff present in the hidden structure and that I think we, we do not accept. So with respect to my, my broader point uh, I think this is interesting because it shows us, I mean, it's we who partition the indeterministic events into E and C. And there are ways of doing that that are very common in, uh, in all the literature on quantum correlation experiments. Um, and here we can give an analysis and we can, we can therefore, on a, on a new level, I think, discuss uh, the possibilities for such extensions. Thanks. All right, thank you very much. Um, people are applauding. Uh, questions? So, as before, just write your name in the, in the chat. So there's a question by Lev. Um, thank you for uh, the lecture. Uh, what I don't understand, why experimentalist is not nature? Well, what is the difference between nature and experimentalist? That's a very, very, very good question. And of course, I don't know either. And there is no physical difference. Right? I, I, think, I think that's clear. We, we are natural, <laughs> natural beings. Um, but the way of representing an experiment makes a distinction between what we're in control of and what happens in nature. And I mean, very simply, if you want to find out the direction of causal influence uh, in some process that happens in nature, you wiggle one parameter and you look at whether another parameter wiggles as, a, uh, as an effect. And if it does, you know the um, direction of causal influence, and if it doesn't, if it doesn't, you also know that it's the different, it's, it's the other way around. So, uh, as physicists, I think we we do make this distinction, and it's important for us. Um, but I'm not saying that I understand on which basis it's made. I mean, but. Uh, Maybe a, a quote that I like very much from David Wiggins, a philosopher um, 
who, 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 who also wrote about experimentation, he says that the lab is a tellingly Aristotelian place. So the, um, the mindset that we have when working as experimentalists is really a very classical one in terms of these possibilities and impossibilities. It will be any kind of uh, technical difficulty if uh, when I'm going to perform my GHZ experiment, I will put a uh, stern gerlach device deciding what kind of experiment I will do in, in every place. Because then it seems uh, nature will decide what to measure in GHZ experiment. Yeah. How, how we will consider them. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm not saying that human choices are very special. I mean, we all, we all have seen, I guess, this paper from the Big Bell uh, test collaboration, and they, they went to great lengths to really use these human choices that they collected through the scamification process to select the measurement uh, directions in these experiments. And in a way, we, I, I think it's a very, very nice exercise, but no one expected, I guess, that anything strange will happen as a result. And all the, the standard experiments, they use very good randomization devices to make these measurement selections, and we're all fine with that. But when analyzing the experiment, we say these selections of the, uh, of the directions, they are C-type in my language, so they belong to experimenters' choices. And what we measure later is E-type. And you can as if we're re describe the whole situation. As I said, if you, if you just take C equal to zero, so everything belongs to nature, then you have no handle on a derivation of, uh, of an impossibility result. And I think that's interesting because it shows us we need to make that split in order to, to say anything interesting about the quantum correlations. At least that's, that's what I think uh, happens here. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Guido had a question. Thanks for the talk. I like that very much. Uh, uh, um, you said uh, um, you had a no-go result, um, and then you showed you know, how it works in the uh, GHZ case. I was just wondering, um, um, is it, is it uh, you know, how, how general is it? You know, how, how does it look like in in general, is that is that easy to is that easy to say? Oh no, <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, no, there there is no no. Gen I don't think you can expect a general result here. What you can expect, maybe, give me a certain. I mean, that would be interesting. I, I just don't know the answer. Give me a certain structure of the rules, let's say, like these x x x y y rules or something. Give me a certain. A structure in the modal correlations present and a certain uh, layout of the C and E type events, in which cases is it possible to give um, a uh, non contextual uh, structure without this C E novel uh, problematic correlations? In which cases is it possible to give, um, to give a, a contextual? extension. I haven't done that exercise. I think it's a worthwhile exercise. Um, but so far, it's really working through each single case. Um, also, of course, there is a probabilistic side to it, where uh, what, what I showed you was really just the analysis of purely modal correlations, where you, would, you know about possibilities or impossibilities. Now, in the lab, of course, it's all probabilistic. And, and this, is, this is an idealized case. Um, and there seems to get even, even messy. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions from anyone? So let, let me ask one question. Can, can you maybe clarify how this approach relates to, to other, um, other approaches to, to explain quantum correlations or correlations in, in such experiments? I mean, in terms of other, other concepts of I don't know, relate your concepts here to, to some other, other proposals for, for explanations? I think all I'm trying to do is really give a mathematically precise language 
for for looking at these explanations. The explanations have been there. Like if you read Merman's article, he basically does nothing nothing else than, than what I've done here. He just says, oh, we cannot assign, for example, let me see whether I can get back to that. Um, if you look look at Merman's article, he says, we can do that, right? So we, we can give the six element uh, instruction set. And then you can say, oh, so there are no instruction sets. And where we can go one step further is by saying, okay, we can give six element instruction sets, but we have a general definition of what a non-contextual instruction set is. And that will be uh, basically the maximal uh, consistent combinations of possible instructions. There's a precise formulation hidden behind this, but um, so for any setup, and it doesn't have to be layered, you know, the, the setups we look at, they're typically layered. First, the experimenter makes a selection, then you measure, and then you analyze. Um, it, it could be different. We can, we can still look at what the um, non-contextual or also the contextual extension looks like as a mathematical object and which properties it has. And we find that you can define it and it has properties we don't like. And I think that's going one step further than just saying you can define it in, in this uh, simplest way. Right? So that's how, how I think it, it both gives more formal a grounding to the analysis. And also it allows you to get this one step further by saying, if I do it, if I do introduce these hidden variables, what do I end up with? And I think that's, that's it complements other approaches in giving this, this new perspective and showing where exactly this distinction between the C-type and E-type indeterminism is used also in rejecting possible explanations, right? We just don't want, it seems, these, um, yeah, deeper modal funny business cases where experimenters' choices are involved. Then we'd rather go for super determinism. That's at least a clean picture, I guess. Okay, thanks for the clarification. Any, any other questions? Uh, I may have a question. Uh, it's very naive, but since we have time. Um, so uh, Thomas, I. I read the um, Belknap paper long, long ago, so I might mm -hmm. not remember. Uh, and I'm happy that you're making this book. I'm very uh, looking forward to reading. it. So uh, what I remember about that, uh, so I, I, I remember the Stars McCall uh, branching time model, uh, yeah. which was uh, a theoretic. So the question is about the philosophy of time. Uh, so the Stars McCall is a, a theoretic, right? And, um, and I remember that, so Belknap wanted to provide a theoretic model, right? So my question is simply, how much of what you were saying today uh, would be uh, sympathetic, um, could be seen as sympathetic by those who prefer the McCall uh, version of the branching space time? And, eventually, and if not, what do you think are the reasons? Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks for that question. Yeah. And um, so, in fact, this happened at more or less the same time, right? And uh, of course, Stores and, and Noel uh, talk to each other. Um, I think so. The motivation for, for Belknap's uh, initial article was really he was working on a logic of agency, which was later uh, published as this seeing to it that logic. And there you have uh, an assumption about the independence of agents, like what I, what I used informally here now. If one agent does something at one point and another does one at a spatial distance, they, their choices should be independent. And he had to stick that in, in the logic, which was branching time-based only, he had to stick that in as an additional uh, assumption. And he wanted to use a relativistic representation so that he had space-like separatedness um, as a possibility, right? Now, McCall, um, he has this uh, strange model whereby you have these decenary trees, right? So you, you get at precise numerical probabilities by stepwise um, 
so basically you first do do one step to get the first digit then you do a, a shorter step to get the second digit and so on so getting a full uh, real numbered probability there is something like a super task so maybe this actually relates to what what nicolas said um it, you can't really compute it so on that grounds i think Storrs's model is more complicated than it would need to be in assigning these probabilities and in the branching space times uh, Belknap type um, probability theory, we have the probabilities just as base level uh, elements and not these um, iterative, as it were, computing the or the, yeah, throwing dice to determine the numbers, the, the digits of the of a random number. So it should also be, um, I mean, in a way, it should also be empirically distinct right because for um for mccall you should at some point be able to to find the, the temporal granularity of determining these digits so that's why some people are very critical about mccall's approach and i tend to agree with that thanks any other questions otherwise we should thank thomas again thank you Thank you very much. Uh, we'll have a, a short break until uh, Julia's talk at uh, 11.40. So sorry for not being able to, to offer you some coffee, but you can enjoy it on your side and feel free to, to hang around and discuss here. And otherwise we'll reconvene at uh, 11.40. Thomas, sorry, I was too, I was not quick enough to ask my question, so I'm asking it now. Okay, yeah, sure. people here. Hi, Gerald, by the way, I'll just see you on the screen. Hello to Australia. <laughs> now, you know, uh, thanks a lot for, for, for your talk. You, the introduction to your presentation, you know, uh, referred to this uh, question about how would we think about an experiment uh, um, that is performed by you know an agent is it uh, and if it's uh, if i understood this correctly if, if, if the agent itself is described as a and completely specified as a, as a natural system for example mm -hmm. something we built and we can fully describe by the laws of physics like an artificial agent uh, the question of attributability is the experiment performed by that agent or is that agent part of the experiment you did not uh, elaborate now on what would you draw as a conclusion from your formal analysis regarding this general question? Can you comment on this? Yeah, thanks. Um, actually, when, when you look at the way people are satisfied or unsatisfied with, uh, with possible explanations or how loopholes are closed, we are, I think, for the most part, uh, completely happy with having non-agents do the measurement selection, right? We have uh, good randomization devices uh, that has, has improved a lot. We have these uh, well-tested um, local machines that, that are quick enough to give us the random bits to make the, the measurement setting determinations. And in the formal analysis, we attribute um, independent agency, as it were, to those uh, selection events. Because if we didn't do that, we couldn't derive a Bell inequality and all, all hope would be lost, so to speak. So we're, we're happy for, for the purposes of that experiment to treat those randomization devices, which are not agents in any sense, as um, the bona fide sources of randomness that are enough. So it, it's really about, an, here it's only about an independence assumption. Yeah, okay. and, and that is, uh, is guaranteed. But the rhetoric around it is one of agency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so if, um, I think it still makes a difference that we know about these randomization devices and we put them in there 
You know, we don't just find them as part of the setup. If we found a setup that had these surface correlations, we would, I think, very naturally say that these parts of the setup, they have to be analyzed as part of what nature does. And then we would not find strange correlations. So it's, it's really, really weird because the agency need not be assumed in, um, in the analysis. But this distinction between two types of, um, of indeterminism, where one is rhetorically tied to agency, uh, that is crucial. Yeah, I see. Thank you.